Uh, Put a finger in Galatians chapter 4, wouldn't you? Just mark that place in your Bible, and then I would like for you to listen very carefully. In fact, lean in a little bit. Place an ear really close. I need you to try to hear this. Are you listening? Listen very, very closely. I think you can hear them. Can you hear them sobbing? Maybe you can hear them shaking even in the middle of of the bushes or behind the trees perhaps. You see, they had taken and eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the minute they did, they knew that was wrong. And they remembered God said not to eat of this and now we're ashamed and we're afraid. And so they're hiding. You can almost hear Adam saying to Eve, do you think he knows where we are? Perhaps she says, he's God. And suddenly, Adam, Adam, where are you? Oh, God knew. He was calling for fellowship, but something had broken that fellowship. And and then in the process of all that discipline and judgment, you know, the curses on the earth, on the serpent, and the judgment on the man, the woman, all those things, God said an intriguing thing that, he said that the seed of the woman would have his heel bruised, but yet the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Can you hear Adam perhaps saying to Eve, what does that mean? But yet he's thankful that this old serpent that tempted them and lured them into sin would finally have his head crushed. But yet what is all of this about? The seed of the woman? Fast forward, Abraham, he was also given a promise. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Really? Then then can you hear Adam's questions? Listen carefully. Can you hear them? I think, yeah, he's asking, then why am I sacrificing my son if, if it's through my seed that all the nations are blessed? And so as he's binding sticks together, as he's placing them on the altar, he's having a conversation with Isaac. Isaac, I know this is really, just seems odd, but I need you to get on the altar. We don't know from the text exactly how that conversation went down, but I think just uh, any normal father and son would have questions at that time, wouldn't you? And so perhaps there's a a lot of uh, discussion, but at some point Isaac gets on the altar and Abraham, with great faith, raises the knife to sacrifice his son, but God stops it and shows Abraham a a ram caught in the bushes. Oh, there's the sacrifice. And somewhere in that symbolic moment, he begins to understand, okay, so it's, it's not just about Isaac, and yet through his seed and through this work you're doing, all the nations are blessed. God, what is this all about? What does this mean? So they take the animal, the ram, and they sacrifice it, and the blood covers their sin. Fast forward to Egypt. Can you hear these guys as well? Can you hear the Israelites groaning and moaning? They're making bricks for Pharaoh. And it's never enough. The whips hit their back. They're hungry. Probably many of them malnourished. They're kept in poverty. Somewhere in those 400 years of slavery, a man named Moses shows up. He tells Pharaoh, you let my people go. But is that really a threat? But actually, Pharaoh should have listened because... Eventually, all these plagues led led to this last one, the death angel. Can you hear the Israelites? They're saying, really, just put the blood over the door and on the sides. God said if we do that, the death angel would pass over us. We won't lose our firstborn. And so they do, and they slaughter a lamb. And that night, God comes and delivers his people. They're they're leaving Egypt with lots of, lots of things and supplies and goods, and yet they're wondering, 
But there's got to be more. It's not just about a future land, is it? It's not just about getting away from Egypt. What's, what's all this pointing to? Why is blood so important? What's happening here? Fast forward to King David. Oh, not in his years as a mighty warring king, but perhaps in the later years of his life. Can you hear him? As perhaps he's bent over and he's looking back at his life and he's filled with wonder and gratitude, no doubt, for God's uh, favor. And yet he's probably filled with some sense of regret for all the dysfunction that he brought upon his family. And perhaps he's asking this. Can you hear him? Are you listening? Can you hear him saying, God, you said I could not build you a home, but that you would build me a dynasty, but I don't see that dynasty. My sons can hardly get along. Sure enough, his sons didn't get along very well. One did really well, Solomon. But after him, the kingdom divided. The north was assaulted and overrun by the Assyrians. Ten tribes pretty much scattered. The south, a few years later, taken captive by those from Babylon. Can you hear them? Can you hear the shuffling of feet as they're marching hundreds of miles? And they'll stay in captivity. They'll be in exile from their home for 70 years. But God, you said that you had a hope for us, a future for us, a plan for us. You said that you would give us a, a new covenant, that you would take out this heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, something living and breathing. This doesn't feel like anything living and breathing. What's going on, God? And throughout all those captivities, even upon their return, they go to rebuild the temple. They get distracted by their own houses. God sends prophets to preach against their materialism, their covetousness, their greed and their pride. They don't listen. They're thinking that you're a little late, God. This is a, I mean, do you see all we've been through from Egypt, Babylon, Assyria? I mean, how can it be true that, that you had something better for us? This doesn't feel better at all. And so at the end of Malachi, God's gone dark. There's not a word from God for 400 years. Silence. And then, a word. More correctly, the word. For at exactly the precise moment at the perfect point in history God sent Jesus was God late in that because if you read the Old Testament you might wonder like it seemed like an earlier time would have been better for a lot of people or was he early because it seems like maybe sending Jesus later would have been even better for some people so, so why then God was that really perfect timing? Here's how Paul would put it in Galatians 4. Your finger's there, right? Look at two verses that describe that exact moment in history that we celebrate this weekend. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Here's how Paul would say it. But, I love that word, in contrast to what's before it, the enslavement that we were experiencing, the ownership we were enduring under the law, all of those things were in play. But when the fullness of time had come, when everything had been brought to its completion that God had ordained and allowed, when all of those things were finally filled up, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Merry Christmas. Amen, church? This is a beautiful set of Christmas verses that describe the impeccable and perfect timing of God's plan in sending Jesus as our Savior. Now, instead of me 
only verbally explaining this verse. Let me do this today. Let me kind of take you to our lab. I want to make sure I explain this verse visually as well. We'll do that for a bit, understand more about what it's saying. We'll take a few Christmas Eve questions at some point. So if you have some, text them in. And then we'll see really just in one sentence how this verse, I think, can set our hearts in the right place for what's to come tomorrow. Here's a beautiful couplet of Christmas verses, Galatians 4, 4, and 5. I want you to notice how they, they really kind of flow. They create, um, we might call it a progression. Tanner kind of put these in this format for me to kind of show the, the, the crescendoing of what's happening here, okay? I may make a few marks for you. If you have room in your Bible, you might want to make these marks too. It'll help you kind of uh, understand what's happening in these verses. Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that when the fullness of time had come, God. So it's our, it's our first major subject here. Write this in with me, would you? This is the mission of God. Something was occurring, and God was waiting on purpose for a specific point in time. When that occurred, then God sent his son. So there's no sense in this verse in which we find God perhaps behind the eight ball, or cornered, or curious. We don't find God in any way going to plan B or C. We don't find God threatened or wondering like, well, is this a good time? Is this a bad time? Did I miss a good entrance? Did I miss my cue? <laughs> the clear point of the text is that when the completion of a, of a certain amount of historical events that occurred, of a, had occurred, then God sent Jesus. It's, it's planned. It's prophesied. It's on purpose. This is what God is up to, by the way, church. Watch this, church. Listen, something planned and on purpose God has been working a plan since the very beginning. What is that plan? It is to send his son. His son is described in these two phrases, at least in this book. So let's put the mission of God first, then let's put the son of God next, can we? Notice how these flow together. In this epistle, Jesus Christ is described as born of a woman and born under the law. A couple of thoughts about this phrase. I think it primarily takes aim at the humanity of Christ. Born of a woman, indicating a, a natural birth, and yet the idea of a man's not mentioned here. So I think there's an allusion to the virgin birth. Mary was overshadowed or impregnated by the Holy Spirit. So still born of a woman, fully human, and in fact born under the law. So born in the same... Um, in one sense, in, in, in the same state as we are, fully human. And yet, he was God's son. Just remember that up here. So we, we have here really, I think, a primary, re a primary reference to his humanity, but I think there's maybe an elusive reference to his deity. Either way, know this church. As a church, we hold to and believe in both the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, what we call the the uh, hypostatic union. Make you sound real smart if you know it, but it, it just does. it's a traditional orthodox word that means two natures, two natures in one. Okay? Christ was fully human and fully God. I think that's being referenced here. This is the one that God sent. And church, listen, this is the one that God had always planned to send. God didn't come up with a good idea when he realized, wow, they're just not listening to me. I guess, Jesus, you got anything going on in the next few hundred years? <laughs> wasn't that way at all. It was always God's plan to send Christ, to become man, to then do something, to redeem. Here we have the gift of God. Now notice some, there's some phrases here that are, that are very similar. Look, under the law is how we were, under the law, is how Christ was, correct? So, so what gives? Are we the same then? No, because he was God's son, so he was perfect. He fulfilled the law completely, whereas we have only done what to the law? Massacred it. <laughs> so here's the massive difference. Though we're both under the law, born that way, 
uh, obligated to his expectations, Christ fulfilled the law, which is why he would say in the Gospels, I have not come to destroy the law, but to do what? To fulfill it. And Christ did this perfectly. So he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. That's why he did this word. See it? Redeem. He paid the price necessary for our purchase, for our redemption. So in Acts 20, 28, when the Bible says that Christ purchased the church with his own blood, he's saying that because he was able to fulfill the whole law perfectly and gave his life as a sacrifice, then God saw his life and death satisfactorily fulfilling everything God demanded And then God raised Christ from the dead, saying, I am satisfied. In doing that, we who could not fulfill the law's demands were what? We were redeemed. We were bought back. Hallelujah, church. This has always been God's plan. It's the mission of God to send his son to redeem. Watch this next now. Uh, Here's the phrase we, an adoption. To redeem The family of God. This verse culminates in this beautiful phrase so that we might receive adoption as sons. So Christ does the redeeming. We do the receiving. He does the work. We get the benefit. That's why it's called a son. It's not called an employee. You're not earning anything. Amen, church? This is not called a wage. This is not called a reward or a prize. It's simply a gift. Your redemption is a beautiful Christmas gift that God had always planned to send through his son to those who would believe and receive. A a note here you might like to know about. This word adoption, it's actually, uh, in in the original language, it's, it's these three words. We see him as adoption of sons. The actual Greek New Testament has one word. And within this word adoption is the word son. The word son in the Greek is huios. So within the long word adoption is the word son. So you could actually say this. this is, I love words and kind of play with them. You could actually say this. This would be a legitimate way to see this verse. So that we might receive a sonship. Or I've used this before. I've said, you know what? When you were saved, you were sonned. You were daughtered. In other words, when God saved you through the work of his son, through that redemption, you were familyed. It's kind of a verb there. You know what I'm saying? That's what's going on here. God does something that only he can do. He takes you from the, the family of darkness, being children of darkness, children of this world. Paul would call them sons of disobedience, and he regenerates us, saves us, uh, adopts us, and he puts us over into his family. That's what's going on. This is what God had planned to do. This was his mission. And his mission from the time of the beginning to to even beyond now to the time of the end will be to bring together into his family someone from every nation, language, tribe, and tongue. This is what God is up to. And he's perfectly, uh, his timing on this has been perfect, impeccable is what I'm saying. He's not late. He didn't miss a juncture in history. He didn't miss a a good spot to to come on the scene. Everything that God has done with sending Jesus has been impeccably perfect. His timing is not off by even a millisecond. This is what God has done for us. His mission has been to send his son who would provide his gift for his people. Isn't this a beautiful set of Christmas verses? of what God has done on our behalf through Christ. Now, here's what I want you to notice about this. These four things, the mission of God always leads to the Son of God, who is the only one who can provide the gift of God to the people of God. They're all kind of connected to this one phrase in the beginning. Fullness of time. Do you see that? Here's what those words are uh, in a literal translation. But when the filling up of chronology has come. That's that's the best way to describe it. The word time here is the word chronos. When I say chronos, what do you hear in there? Chronological, chronology. You think of tick-tock time. It was 6 o'clock, now it's 8 o'clock, 
tomorrow is the next day. That's a chronology of time. What, what is being said here is this, that when God looked at the, the historical timeline, so to speak, he knew exactly when Christ was to come. And so he ordained and required that a number of things happen chronologically, and I would even say perfectly. And at just the right impeccable moment, God said, now's the time for Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? That's what's going on here. All those things in the Old Testament you read about, that you think, man, that would have been a good time for Christ to come then. No, that wasn't God's time. Or how about then? Or how about there? God knew exactly, chronologically, when Jesus was to come in order to fulfill every single prophecy and prediction that was made about him. And he came at precisely the perfect moment. When he came, by the way, every single one of the Old Testament prophecies and predictions was fulfilled to the letter. Meaning only Jesus could be the long-awaited Christ. This is what Paul's exclaiming here. That in the completion of chronological time, then God did what only God could do. He sent himself in the second person of the Trinity to do what only Jesus could do, redeem us. And then those who would believe and receive are sonned. We're daughtered. We are adopted. Merry Christmas. Amen? Amen? This is really what we're celebrating. God's impeccable timing. And I might add, it's, it's impeccable, not in that he gives us a what, but it's impeccable in that he knows when to give us the right who. Because the verse is clear. He sent his son. So God's timing is perfect in that he, he gave us the one who could meet our deepest need. I'm so thankful for God's impeccable timing in sending Jesus. Uh, just as a side note here, the word time in this verse is chronos. If you were to go to Romans 5, 6, you would find that the word there is time as well. Here's how Romans 5, 6 reads. That when we were weak at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, you may think, was well, that the same word? Is that the same chronos? No. That's the word kairos. So watch this. There's two words in the Greek language for time. Chronos, which is here, historical completion of events. And then kairos, which means it's like it's time. You don't really have a tick-tock to it. You have like this sense of like, hey, it's time. It's like what a, a pregnant woman would say to her husband. It's time. He's not asking I mean, she's not wondering what time it is, is she? She's saying what? Let's get to the hospital. It's time. He just knows. He's not worried about seconds and minutes and TikToks. He knows we've got to get to the car, right? Romans 5, 6 is this kind of time. God knew that the need was great, our souls were lost, and the prophecies had been all fulfilled. Now's the time. And yet that same word, uh, that, that same event is described as being the perfect time chronologically. So here's what I'm saying to you. In every sense of the word time, God was perfect and impeccable. Historically, chronologically, spiritually, relationally, in every sense of the word, God was right on time for our greatest need. Amen? I'm so thankful that that God is impeccable in this timing because we're often not. Let me make that more personal. I'm often not. I was thinking through this past week or so. Sometimes I've just not been good in my timing. And I've got a pretty long list to choose from, okay? <laughs> uh, but the one that I think is most humorous to me, some of you know this story, is when I proposed to Julie. I not only blew some of the timing elements when I asked her dad, uh, he was down for a whole day. And I waited till the very end when he's in the car and I'm asking him through the window and he's almost driving off. I went to ask you, friend. And she's like, are you going to ask him? I'm like, yeah. And it worked out, praise the Lord, amen. But, but even beyond that, uh, when I had the official proposal with the ring, that whole kind of deal, we kind of knew we were getting married. We'd gotten permission. And, but I kind of want to make a special environment to give her the ring. And 
So I had this thought, I'll do it at the Braves game. This is probably why you love the Braves so much, Brett. That's all I can figure, because I don't like him at all, right? <laughs> and so I, I called down there one morning. I said, hey, do you guys um, do the matrix board thing where you can put up someone's name and ask him to marry you? And believe it or not, the person who answered the phone that day was the matrix board operator. Because he said, well, I run that board. I'm running tonight. What do you need? I was like, really? I mean, you're the guy? He said, yeah. I was like, this is crazy. Uh, this is awesome. I said, I need you to say, Julie Smith in row, I forget what row or seat, will you marry me, Todd? He goes, yeah, I'll take care of it. Between innings one and three, don't be late. You're laughing already, aren't you? Yeah. It wasn't because she made us late. I don't know why we were late, but sure enough, uh, she was living with an older woman from our church, and I had an apartment, I think, in that area. And so I picked her up, and uh, let's go to the game. And she said, sure, and we had our tickets. But for some reason, we were running, running late. And Douglasville, where we lived, was about 30 to 40 minutes outside of Atlanta, uh, even though it's on a regular traffic day. But Atlanta always has terrible traffic. Um, I think since the creation, it's had terrible traffic. So... Um, <laughs> So we're trying to weave through traffic, and this is just kind of getting to me little by little. I'm just, I'm getting sanctified in the area, okay? I'm not real good in that, but when things don't go like I think they should go, I can sometimes um, just not be the nicest guy in the world. So I'm getting flustered and fleshly. She's like, what's up? We got nine innings. I'm like, no, we need to see the first inning, okay? (laughs) She's like, relax. And she doesn't know what's coming, and, and, um, so, so we're driving, we're weaving, we get to the parking lot, we're trying to find it, we pay the $10 to park, er, slam it in the park, I run out, I'm like, come on, let's go, and she's like, you know, and she's checking the mirror, probably doing the lipstick thing, you know, whatever, and I'm like, can you hurry, please, you know, and so we get out of the car, and we're literally, I think we're kind of, you know, getting to the, she's like, can we just walk, I said, we can't walk, so we gotta run, come on, let's go, we're, we're trying to get there, and what gate, and what, you know, how to go in, and Sure enough, we, it, we missed some part of the first inning. I know that because we got there it already started. And I'm thinking, if he did that at the bottom of the first, I'll, I'm not even going to get married now, apparently, you know. <laughs> not really. But I had the bottom of the first, the top of the second. I thought, you know, I just got to get there. So we rush in. We find our seats. We locate them. We sit down. And, I mean, literally, I think I sat her down. Okay, sit right here. And I'm starting to scan the stadium for the matrix board. There it is. And I'm just glaring at it, you know. And she's just trying to get adjusted. And she goes, what's the matter? I'm like, just don't talk to me right now. I'm waiting on the message, you know. (laughs) I don't know if we've missed it. Uh, I think probably bottom of the second is when it happened. All I know is the message came up. So I'm like, I can get married. That's good, you know. So then I realized, oh, but she's got to see it. And I haven't shown her where the matrix board is. So I'm like, do you see the matrix board? I'm trying to be real cool now, real calm, right? Hey, do you see the matrix board? She's like, no, where's that? I'm like, uh, what do you mean, where's that? It's right there. Where? I'm like, I've got seconds left on this matrix board. I'm like, there. Take your hand and look over there. There's the message, you know. And she sees it. I'm reaching in my pocket that time to find the ring. Oh, I got it good. She looks back at me. I got the ring. She says, yes. Everybody cheers. We got married. Praise God, right? <laughs> I missed several moments in that whole story. There were several, multiple times, I'm sure, I'm like, man, that was not the best timing. I shouldn't have said that then. I shouldn't have done that that way. I should have left earlier. You know what? God's never had one of those moments. God's never, for a single millisecond of time, missed an opportunity. God has never just been a had late, stuck in traffic, said the wrong thing, did something a tad too early. That's never happened with God. He has impeccable timing. So Christmas, in all of its beauty, And yet in all of its reality that it's hard to understand sometimes, like why then and why that way? There's nothing about it that wasn't perfect and impeccable and from God. Because it was the completion of every bit of chronological events that occurred that then said, the time is now. Send Jesus. God did. 
And then Jesus lived a perfect life, gave his life in a perfect death to pay the price for our sin as our substitute so that all those who then would believe and receive would be adopted as sons. Every bit of that is impeccably perfect. Hallelujah. Merry Christmas. That's what we're remembering. And in fact, that's really what Christmas showcases. Christmas showcases God's perfect timing on behalf of poor sinners. Namely, the priceless gift of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. He is the gift. He's the real object of God's perfect timing. It's Jesus. So tonight or tomorrow when you're opening presents, more power to you. It's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm good with that. Hope you are too. That, it's fun. But the real object is not the presence or your tree or your traditions. The real object is Jesus Christ. And he came at exactly the right time to save poor sinners from hell and to redeem us so that we could be called the family of God. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't God just glorious? Isn't he adorable? No wonder we would say, oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Well, I'll take a couple of questions, but before I do, I want to ask you to do something. I want you to take that truth there, that single sentence, and I want you to personalize it. Have you experienced God's perfect timing on your behalf? Have you trusted in Jesus as your only way to be saved? You see, if God is perfect in his timing, and he is, we maybe should say since God is perfect, perfect and impeccable in his timing, that means he's never been a moment early, too early or too late. He's never been off for a second in your life. So it's not accidental that you're here this morning. What's happened this holiday season is not accidental. What's going on in your life this week, last month, the reason you are where you are, none of that is accidental. I agree with you that maybe we don't understand it. Just read the Old Testament. <laughs> but God was waiting till everything was at its full completion. Then he sent Jesus. And the same is true in your life. He's waiting for just the right time to do what you need. And today is no accident. God has intersected your path with this message by his sovereign will. Do you know that? Maybe you're there today and you're thinking, well, I've... I don't know that I've ever trusted Christ. If I had to pay for my sin, I'd be left to do that on my own. I don't believe in Christ. I didn't know that he had come and died for me. Although those are things that I just have never embraced. Could it be that this morning God has timed your path to intersect with this beautiful message of the gospel so that you would repent and be saved this morning? Say, Todd, what does that look like? It looks like this. You see your need of Jesus, like, wow, I am lost. I have broken the law. I have no way to make myself right with God. I have no way to fix this. But if Jesus lived and died for me, and if he fulfilled God's law perfectly, if he is the one I need to be in in order to avoid God's wrath, then then this morning I want to believe in Jesus Christ as the only way to be saved. You see, Jesus Christ is, in a lot of ways, our shield Without him, you stand under God's wrath. But when you're in Christ, you're shielded from God's wrath. Are you in Christ? Have you received the gift of being adopted into his family? That doesn't happen because you fill out a card with a certain kind of pen, by the way, or that you walk an aisle and have a certain posture, or that you say a certain kind of prayer. Those aren't the ways we're saved. Do you hear me? Loud and clear? Those are vehicles that God could use to indicate he saved you, yes. But we're not saved by a pen or a posture or a prayer. We're saved by God through Christ when the posture of our heart is this. God, without you and the sending of your son, I'm lost forever. I repent of my sin I'm trusting Christ is the only way to be shielded from your wrath. Would you save me through Jesus? And when God sees the posture of that heart, he saves. 
So personalize that, would you? Have you ever trusted and asked God to save you? If not, the fact that you're here this morning is not accidental. It is perfectly time to meet the greatest need in your life. And I would just urge you to realize God loves you so much that he sent Jesus Christ at exactly the perfect moment to redeem you from things you could not redeem yourself so that you could be considered a daughter or son of God. Merry Christmas. How about a few questions? Let's do that and then we'll wrap this up this morning. A couple of questions. Because of Christ's full humanity, along with his full deity, could he have sinned if he wanted to? This is a great question. There is a divergence of opinion on this. I am of the opinion that he could not have sinned. That is called, and the word just slipped my brain, the impeccability of Christ. There's the word. It's kind of a $10 word, I know. But I do believe that uh, though Christ experienced everything we experienced as a man, fully human, I don't believe he could have sinned. In my opinion, this is why the virgin birth matters. Because being born of a woman, not of a man, he did not have that, that sin capacity, that sin nature, which comes through Adam. Again, good men and women disagree on this, all right? Even in our church, and so this is not something that you're, you're probably going to like fight over. But just to answer the question, I don't believe he could have sinned, and yet I do believe Hebrews is right. In every way he was tempted as we are, and so he understands what it's like to be human. But I don't believe he had the sin nature because he was virgin born of the Holy Spirit, not born of Adam. If we disagree, no problem. Merry Christmas to you too. We can shake hands and exchange gifts later, okay? Great, I thought so. Next question. Would you say that God ordained the celebration of Jesus' coming on December 25th? Well, I want to make sure I answer this correctly because the word ordained is going to throw us off here. First of all, God ordains everything that happens. He is sovereign, amen? So if you ask me if he ordained Christmas, I would say, well, yes, he knows and knew it would happen. and he, He's the first cause of all things, but does God scripturally dictate that we celebrate his coming on that day? No, he doesn't, okay? So I'd rather change the word ordained. I mean, does the Bible say we have to have Christmas on this day? No. In fact, Christ probably wasn't born in December. He was probably born in the fall. Um, and there's a number of traditions that necessarily aren't biblical, but that doesn't make them unbiblical either, right? I think it's an area of freedom. We can celebrate the arrival of Christ in this perfect, impeccable manner in the month of December. That's fine. There's nothing unbiblical about that. We can use a tree. We can open gifts. Those are great doesn't mean that it's in the Bible. So if you're asking, is this a command of God on this day? No. But if you're asking, does God know about it and oversee it? Well, yes, he's God. Amen? But no, that date and that time of year and the way we do it with trees and presents and carols, those aren't things in the Bible. There's a lot of freedom there. Uh, in fact, just ask someone sitting near you, how do you celebrate Christmas? And within five minutes, you'll have understanding of how much freedom we have. We all do it differently, don't we? I was talking with someone out in the cafe between services, and they were asking some things about our family, and I said, well, you know what? Here's what we do, and you're going to think this is really carnal of your pastor, but we do a lot of things on Christmas Eve, and we talk about it all month, but when Christmas morning comes, man, it's ring the Christmas bell and dive in the presence under the tree. We don't read the story. We don't pray. We don't eat breakfast. We get right to the presence, you know? And they were like, oh, you're pretty normal, dude, you know? <laughs> we always have been. That's just us. We don't think it's bad. There's a lot of freedom. Some of you folks will... Have a big, maybe like meal, and you'll read the story. That's awesome. There's a lot of freedom there. What we have to do is remember that Christ, his coming, is what we're celebrating. So don't let the commercialization of it take your focus away, regardless of when you celebrate it. Okay. Good question. I appreciate that question. Is there one more? Let's take it. If we are adopted, does that mean that not everyone is a son or daughter of God? That's exactly what that means. Just because you're alive on the earth does not mean that you automatically are in God's family. Now, I want to preface, I want to qualify that with this comment. In Acts chapter 17, Paul actually calls all the people in that group he was speaking to 
God's children. And they were, most of them, they were pagan. They were at Mars Hill at the Areopagus. So you may say to me, well, Todd, that's not true because Paul, one of the best apostles, wrote most of the New Testament. He called everybody God's children, so there. But in the context of what Paul is saying, he's actually referring to the fact that God created everything. And he points to the crowd and says, even you, you're God's children. Paul was saying this, by creation, everyone belongs to God, but by conversion, not everyone belongs to God. Did you catch that? And when Paul here speaks about adoption being the result of of receiving the redemption, of course, that Christ has purchased for us, he's talking about conversion. He's talking about the spiritual act whereby God changes our heart. We believe in the gospel. We're adopted into his family. Not everyone is that. That happens upon conversion. When God takes someone from being dead in darkness and makes them alive in Christ. It's called salvation. It's called redemption. It's that moment in time when when God perfectly intersects your life with the gospel and brings you to your knees and you repent of your sin and trust in Jesus. That's when you're adopted. Does that make sense? Which means there are some who aren't adopted. Which means let's have the gospel message on our tongues readily. Amen, church? And talk about the joy and the the glorious privilege of being sunned or daughtered or familyed by a God who would love us so much that he would send his only son at exactly the perfectly precise moment to redeem us. Good questions today, thank you. Kind of a Christmas Eve version of that. Well, let me ask you to lean in again and just hear one last thing, could you? Can, can, wait, can you hear them? Yeah, one, one last conversation I want you to hear. Listen real close, okay? Do you hear the disciples? They've seen the crucifixion and the resurrection, and now they're watching him ascend. And, and they're probably thinking, he, he came, now why is he leaving? I know he said the Holy Spirit would not come if he didn't leave, but I kind of liked it when he was here. So, so why are you going away? And the angel says, why do you stand here so amazed? Don't you know that this same Jesus that you have seen go into heaven, he will come again. Now church, listen very carefully. Just as God was impeccable in his timing on Christ's first coming, he will be the same way in the second coming. So you do not need to fear or worry that, well, he's late. Or now would be a good time, please. Or did God fall asleep? Maybe he forgot and misplaced his to-do list. God wasn't early or late in the first advent. He was precisely on time in every sense of the word. And guess what? Now that we're waiting for the second advent, he's not early or late. He's precisely on time in every sense sense of the word here's how Paul would write it to Titus look at these two verses as we close he mentions both advents here I love this set of verses for the grace of God has what appeared past tense who's this referring to it's referring to Jesus Christ he appeared at the at exactly the precise time that God had arranged He brought salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. So we're doing that, and what are we doing while we're we're living godly lives, while we're training ourselves? We are what? Say it with me, underlined word. We are waiting. Also, there is still yet another return. Yes, his first advent was as a baby. His second advent will be as a warrior. He first came to die. He'll come again to reign. That's what we're waiting on. The blessed hope, notice the present tense word now, the what? The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to, say it with me, redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who were zealous for good works. Guess what, church? While we're waiting 
You have no fear or worry that he's going to be late or early. He'll be right on time in every sense of the word. Hallelujah. He's impeccable in his timing. He was in his first advent. He will be in his second. Glory to God. Merry Christmas. Let's pray.